We all know rapport is very important. And why is rapport like money? So I'm going to leave that question hanging in the air for a minute. What I'd like you to do now is just to think about when, when you haven't got rapport. You know when you go in a shop and someone kind of almost... Say, or you phone a, a call centre and they go, oh, computer says no, or whatever. We all know what it's like to be greeted by somebody who doesn't really seem to care about us, and it's not inspiring. But we can learn to do these things differently. So within your tables, it's great. Oh, somebody's turned me off, I think. Am I still? Am I still? Yeah, OK. Uh, if you find somebody on your table to form a pair with, I know some tables have got like odd numbers, but try and just kind of look at somebody without speaking to them so that you know that you're going to work together. Um, and like, oh, yes. And if, you're, if you find yourself being the third party, well, get yourself in a three then, uh, if you have to. OK, OK. So... Have you all got somebody that you've made eye contact with and you know, you know you're going to work with them, yeah? Okay. So what I'm going to do now is teach you the three very simple things that you need to do to build a rapport with somebody very quickly. Okay, there's only three things you have to do. And I'm going to practice on... Uh, you're here, sorry. You looked at me, you caught my eye. So the three things are to make eye contact... So we're looking at each other. I'm going to give you a nice big smile. And a smile that uses my eyes, not a kind of, but a kind of really nice smile. And then the next thing you have to do, it doesn't even show, but I'm going to send you a silent message of warmth and goodwill. <laughs> and then you can say, hello, my name is Avril Danchak. I'm a GP or Michael McIntyre, if you prefer. So what I want everybody to do is to find their partner, I think you two are going to be partners, and you two are going to be partners. Don't make me look over my glasses, guys. Terrible things happen then. And I want you, without speaking, to look at your partner right now. Look them in the eye. Look them in the eye. Smile. Give them a silent message of goodwill. I don't know why you're laughing. God. I need a teacher here. <laughs> Advice, please. How do I make them shut up now? Uh, apparently, I have to say, you've let, you've let me down. You've let your parents down. And most of all, you've let yourselves down. Okay? So, shh. I do want you all to be silent now. This is important. So, look in your partner's eyes. Smile warmly at them and send them a silent message of goodwill. And then in your own time, you can say, hello, my name is, and tell them who you are. Okay, off you go. I'll do it with you. Hello. You all right? My name's Avril Danchak. My name is Christopher Lewis. Okay, great. That's about as long as it's going to take. Okay, okay. I'm really pleased that you're all making so much noise because that tells me that you're not asleep after lunch. This is very exciting for me. Okay, but I am going to ask you to shh a bit now. Okay, so now I want you to think about... We all think about the patients all the time, don't we? But I want to think about you in your role, seeing patients. Now, if you look somebody in the eye and you smile at them and you send a lovely, warm message of goodwill, how did it make you feel as the person who's sending the goodwill? How did you feel? Anybody like to tell me how it felt? Go on. You felt? You felt positive, yeah. Any other word that might pop in? Happy to help. I like the word happy. Makes you feel good, yeah. What a great way to start a consultation is to feel happy, feeling good and positive. So when you do that, forget about what it does to the patient. It makes you feel better, okay? Now, I want you to talk again to your partners that you had and just say, how did it feel when you were on the receiving end of the silent message of goodwill? So you can have a moment just to discuss that. What was it like when you received that?
Okay? Okay, let's stop there. I'm, I'm going to take a punt here. And I think that for most of you, when you received that silent message of goodwill, it actually felt pretty much the same as when you were giving that silent message of goodwill. You probably felt a bit happier. You felt that person was paying attention. You felt a little bit more relaxed. Uh, did you shake your head? Well, go on, tell us why you shook your head. I love dissent. I think sometimes it depends on how the patient is feeling and why the patient is coming. So I could have come in because I've been disappointed in the system or I'm a bit mm. annoyed and someone is smiling at me and I'm thinking, what the hell is she smiling at? Okay. <laughs> no, really, really good point because there's two very important points in what you've said there. First of all... Every patient brings their own thing into the consultation, don't they? And just because somebody walks through the door, you don't know what that is, okay? This is not about sort of being, oh, great, it's, you know, everything's marvellous. It's about greeting somebody with warmth and sending a message of goodwill. Now, if somebody's had a really horrible time, let's say they're that poor homeless lady who couldn't register with the GP, and then she does come to see you because you have registered her, she might be quite tense, nervous, and anxious, mightn't she? But if she sees you smile kindly and send a silent message of goodwill before you say, hello, my name's Dr. Dancha, I'm pleased to see you come and sit down, even that tiny few seconds is going to make a difference. But it's not about pretending that everything's marvellous. Our job, what's our job? Is to look after people's health. And that means we're constantly in the presence of pain and suffering and difficulty. That's what we do. Doctors love diseases. That's, that's why we're doctors, isn't it? We're not there because people are marvellous. But at the same time, we have to connect with every single person. Now, Liam, I'm going to ask you to um, just whiz to the PDF that I talked about, which is called Why is Rapport Like Money? And if you can just, um, I don't know if that's it, brilliant, stop there. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about how you can access the resources to help you learn this sort of thing. But I just love this quote, which says, Rapport is like money. It increases in importance when you don't have any. And when you do have it, lots of opportunities appear. And if you don't have a rapport with people, you can't do very much with them. And I'm so thrilled you're taking pictures, but all this is freely available on the TALC website, as I'll be showing to you in a, in a little while. Okay. Now, what we've just done there is to practice one which educators often call a micro-skill. That is to say, to practice not every skill you need a consultation, but one specific skill. And um, the TALP resources are constructed to help you learn very specific skills and to help you learn them one by one. And the other important thing is that the TALP resources also tell you how to learn the skills and how to teach the skills to other people. So in one place, you can find the skills you need to consult like a ninja. That's what my friend Mohan calls it. And you also can find the skills to learn them and to teach other people. So it's all in one place. It's free, it's friendly, and it's fantastic. I wrote that this morning and thought that was rather good on the bus. So I hope you like that. Okay, so I'm going to show you around the TARP resources now so that you understand how they work. And Liam's got the front page up here for me. And there's a little bit of general stuff. And then there are two animations there, which we're going to come back to. And then this is the real business end of TALC. So it's divided into modules, and I'm going to explain to you how they work in a minute, which is that great big button there. Uh, there's stuff about the TALC team, because there's a wonderful team of people who've worked on this. There's some stuff called how to, which is how to make the most of the resources and how to learn your consultation skills effectively, quickly, enjoyably. And for those of you who've got exams and stuff like that, and to pass your exams as well. We'd love you to give us some feedback. There's some frequently asked questions because it's a website and you can't have a website without facts, can you, these days? Uh, and there's a little button there called What's New in Talc. And we, we keep dropping, as we develop new resources, we drop new things in there. So just have a look in there and see what's new. And then this is the exciting thing that's, again, come to me today. There's a whole section on what we've started to call remote consulting, haven't we? Or virtual consulting or something like that. Now... I've never been completely happy with that because I don't want to be a remote GP and I don't think most people want their GPs to be remote. So when we were in conversation this morning, uh, we came up with a new word, which is to call it convenient consulting. 
Now, how cool would it be if on all your websites, instead of saying, we sometimes consult remotely, we said, we can consult conveniently for you, or this is about convenient consulting. And so I just offer that, and I think uh, we may be talking to Liam about changing the wording at some point. So there's whole special resources in there about what to do if your patient is not in the room with you. Uh, and there's some other things which we'll be talking about in the resources. So when we go to that thing about establishing rapport, you know that PDF that I showed you, there's a whole section in every one of the chapters about how to apply those skills if the patient is not in the room with you. So if they're on the telephone or if they're on video, if you're doing that kind of thing. Because the skills of excellent consulting can be used anywhere and everywhere. And if you want to practice being really good at establishing rapport, um, for the rest of the day now, every time you meet somebody, make, make that eye contact, smile, send them a very silent message of goodwill, and see what happens to the bus driver or the lady in the, uh, or the, lady in the supermarket. And if you say to the lady in the supermarket, you know, you read a badge and say, oh, hello, silent message of goodwill. Thank you, Linda. Linda will go, oh, how did you know my name? And, you know, you get better service that way, apart from anything else. But it's also a great way to practice your skills. And the skills that we want to practice can be practiced almost everywhere, with your patients, your colleagues, at home, your children, people in the supermarket. Okay, so I'm going to show you a little animation that's on the front page. Um, Liam, can you show the one that is... Um, getting the most from the TARP resources, the one that's on the right side here. And this explains how the resources are put together, and then we're going to work through it together so you can see. Getting the most from the TARP resources. TARP, Teaching and Learning Consultation Skills, is a series of modules which cover all aspects of the consultation. The modules are mapped to the Calgary-Cambridge framework for the consultation and the contents of each chapter are mapped to the skills listed in the Calgary-Cambridge Process Guide for easy reference. The skills are shown as the CG skills in each introduction to help learners and educators clarify which skills are covered. After the introduction to each skill, the coloured pages in the PDFs are for educators and they have suggestions for teaching skills either one-to-one -one or in groups. There's a master list of the skills in the library module also. Each module has an introductory infographic that summarises the contents, so it's easy to find what you're looking for. Each module is subdivided into chapters, and each chapter contains written resources about the skills, which are downloadable and shareable in PDF form, and includes specific tried and tested ideas about the best ways to teach and learn the skills described. Alongside that, there are podcasts where the skills are discussed with expert educators and with people who are learning the skills. There are also video demonstrations of the skills and each chapter is self-contained and bite-sized, building together with the other chapters to deliver comprehensive training. There's a library module as well, which contains references and resources to deepen your learning. Look out for new chapters and modules as they are added to the site in future. If you want to improve your own consultation skills, you can work through the module systematically, starting with TALC Skills for Beginning Consultations Effectively and working through to TALC Skills for Effective Endings to the consultation. Or you can browse the modules and chapters for aspects that spark your own interest. Alternatively, you can work on a specific consultation skill or problem by going to the exact chapter that you need. If you are an educator or a supervisor and your task is to help others to improve their consultation skills, then Module 9, TALC, Effective Methods for Teaching Consultation Skills, is particularly for you. It contains details of tried and tested methods for teaching the skills. Educators can also use the resources by directing their learners to the specific modules or chapters that are relevant to their own needs. Visit TALC teaching and learning consultation skills at the Greater Manchester Training Hub, www.gmthub.co.uk forward slash talc. Hey, thanks very much, Liam. So that kind of sets out the structure. But of course, we all learn better by doing than by being witted at, even with a pretty animation like that. So what we're going to do is have a think about how we might actually use this in practice. 
Now, one thing um, we talked a lot about this morning was well-being, wasn't it? There was that very interesting set of resources. Um, I've forgotten her name, Dr. Shavri. I've written it down. Just, you know, who I'm talking about, who talked about the GM uh, well-being resources. And amongst this whole set of resources in Talc, we've included some resources to help you feel better and to look after you. So, Lim, if you could go to module eight for a moment. Uh, this is module eight. And module eight has got two things, three things, really. It's got some learning nuggets for when you've only got a few minutes. And it's also got some inspirations and thoughts for the day and things to relax you. So I know I said I, I wanted you all to be wide awake, but I think you deserve a little rest now. So I'd like you all to close your eyes and imagine that you've just had a rather horrible, stressful consultation and that you actually feel quite stressed and you think you need a little break. Uh, don't be embarrassed because everybody else has got their eyes closed, I can see. Uh, and I'm going to invite you to discover your inner tea bag. And this is one of the resources on the talc framework. Liam, help them discover their inner tea bag. We all know that having a cup of tea can make us feel a bit better. But did you know that discovering your inner tea bag can also make you feel a bit better? Here's some advice from a poet called Peter Dixon about discovering your inner tea bag. The poem is called Tea Bag. I'd like to be a tea bag and stay at home all day and talk to other tea bags in a tea bag sort of way. I'd love to be a tea bag and lie in a little box and never has, have to wash my face or change my dirty socks. I'd like to be a tetley bag, an Earl Grey one perhaps, and doze all day and lie around with Earl Grey kind of chaps. I wouldn't have to do a thing, no homework, jobs or chores, just lie inside a comfy box of tea bags and their snores. I wouldn't have to do exams. I needn't tidy rooms or sweep the floor or feed the cat or wash up all the spoons. I wouldn't have to do a thing. A life of bliss, you see, except that once in all my life, I'd make a cup of tea. So if you want to discover your inner tea bag because you need a little lie down, and a little bit of a rest. All you need to do is listen to this poem. And then you can make yourself a cup of tea if you need to. Thanks, Liam. Thank you. So, um, we've talked a bit about how you can use the modules in Talc systematically. And Liam, if you can go through the Access All Modules button uh, to show us what, how all the modules are. If you go through Access All Modules, you'll see this beautiful, clean, simple, straightforward layout. Each module has got a button of its own. This is mobile phone friendly. You can easily access it on your phone. Um, that poem was just one of many podcasts on the site, and they're all mobile friendly too. So you can listen to them while you're driving or washing up. I wouldn't necessarily listen to my inner tea bag if I was driving because it might make me drop off to sleep. But you can listen to the other podcasts, what podcasts when you're doing that sort of thing. Uh, and so there are th the modules cover, if we start at the beginning, if we just go up a little bit or down a little bit, it begins with skills for beginning consultations effectively. Then there are skills for building effective relationships. Until you have a good relationship with your patient, you can't do anything else. They won't tell you anything or trust you or do what you say. There are skills for effective information gathering, and each parts of these tell you how to teach and learn this. There are essential skills for effective explanations and for planning care that's personalised to the individual. All our speakers so far this morning have emphasised this, haven't they? That not every patient is the same, not everybody needs the same. Then module five is advanced skills for that area as well. Module six is about effective endings. And module seven is very popular. It's called skills for managing time effectively in consultations. And it can help your consultations to run to time more easily. Module eight, as we know, is learning nuggets for when you, you just need a little break in the day. And module nine is primarily for educators. It's about the, the methods you can use for teaching consultation skills. So now you all formed a lovely rapport with the person sitting next to you or somebody on your table. So what I'd like you to do now, and I'm going to give you about three or four minutes to do this because I'm very mindful of the time, is I'd like you to discuss and kind of try and identify some of the difficulties that you have when you're consulting with people. What gives you trouble? What makes it more difficult? Okay. 
Why doesn't it go smoothly as you'd like? So have a chat about that for a few minutes. Okay, um, Liam, can I, um, I'm going to need you in a minute. Okay, well, one thing uh, that I think I've learned from Michael McIntyre, apart from that you're supposed to walk up and down the stage like this um, and make eye contact with people on all sides of the room, is that it's good to stop while everyone's still talking. So I'm going to stop you there. Um, and I'm just wondering if anybody would like to uh, proffer, not necessarily a problem they have themselves, but maybe a problem they think other people might have in the consultation or that they've heard that somebody else has in the consultation or even a problem of their own if you'd like. So... Uh, any thoughts about the kind of things that give you difficulties in consultations? We're going to have a roving mic, but you can also shout at me. I won't mind. A couple of things we discussed. One is the time pressure. Time pressure. Okay, great. I'm just going to, I'm going to write these. I'm going to write these down so that I don't forget. Yeah, time. Anybody else got a suggestion? Patients who are really chatty and want to tell you everything. Is that really a, a kind of manifestation of time as well? Yeah, okay, okay. Any other problems? Interpretation. Yeah, uh, I think interpretation is a huge thing. All I can say is the quick answer is it takes three times as long and just face that right from the beginning because if you start thinking you're going to do it in normal time, you just make yourself stressed, so don't do that. Uh, any other thoughts about things that you have trouble with? Yeah, manage, managing patients' expectations. So finding out what they are, but then managing them afterwards. And I guess that might include like having to say no to people as well sometimes. Yeah, does that difficult? Do you all love saying no to people? Not really. Yes. Oh, yes. Can you learn to love a patient who has a list? You can tell by the way I asked that question that the answer is yes, you can. And Talc is going to teach you how to do it. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about absolutely every possible uh, problem you might have, but um, um, we've got four there. So um, what I'm going to do is talk you through just for a minute about how you might deal with that. So let's start, because it comes near the beginning, the patient with the list. So you access all modules, first of all. And when you get into Access All Modules, you'll see this. Now, the person with the list or the patient with loads of symptoms, it's about the way the consultation begins, isn't it? Uh, and if you think it's about the way the consultation ends when they say, and by the way, I want to talk to you about my knees, my toes, my ears, my nose, and my mother-in-law, then actually what you need to know is that's a problem at the beginning of the consultation, not at the end. So if we go into Module 1, um, Liam... And if you go down, you'll see, first of all, there's an infographic which summarises uh, Module 1. And then if you keep going down, uh, there's two, 
two chapters about preparing before the patient comes in, and that's one about the patient, and can you go home with energy to spare is about you. There's the one we talked about, about rapport, and then if you go down further, keep going. Keep going a bit further. Uh, where are we? Yes, keep going. And there are these two chapters which are relevant to this question of a list. The first one is called, How is a consultation like a business meeting? And that covers why it is that you need to think of yourselves as the chair of a meeting. And the chair is responsible for organising the agenda, not controlling everything on the agenda, but organising the agenda and the time. And there's in there you'll find an introduction, which is a discussion with a number of expert educators, a podcast that you can listen to, and a PDF that explains how to set an agenda and also explains how to teach and learn it. But then there are those patients, aren't there, who come in with a list. And if we just go down further, you'll also see here there are some videos demonstrating those skills, which are well worth watching. And then if you come down here, you'll get my favourite chapter, which is can you learn to love a patient with a list? Okay. Now, I'm not going to go through what's in that chapter in huge detail. Suffice to say, lists are normal in primary care. And if you just get over the idea that people are not going to come with a single problem and you take it as normal that they're going to have a list. And if they have a list on a piece of paper, say thank you, that is brilliant. That changes how you feel. But also the patient has done some work for you, haven't they? They've thought about what they want to talk to you about. They've written it down on a piece of paper. It can help you to deal with things. And the more advanced skills, other than what I've just said, are all in that section there. So that's how you would solve a problem, if you like, in a consultation. So so let's go back to access all modules, please, Liam. Um, and let's just talk about managing patients' expectations. So uh, if you can go into access all modules. Now, um, there's two aspects to managing people's expectations. The first module, um, the first thing is to know what their expectations are in the first place. Because one of the huge problems we have is that people think, like I think Carolyn Chu Graham mentioned, that people think they've all got to have a chest x-ray when they've got uh, prolonged COVID symptoms. Well, some of them need a chest x-ray, but not all of them need an x-ray. But unless you know that, if you don't provide an x-ray, the patient's going to go home and say, oh, that Dr. Danchak, she didn't even organise an x-ray, because that's what I was expecting. So let's go into module three, skills for information gathering. And if you just, again, there's an infographic summarising it. If you just keep going down, keep going down, keep going down, keep going down. Yes, yes, yes. I'll oh, stop here. Okay. Um, so, uh, where are we? No, I think it's the next one, actually, Liam. Yes, here we go. So, TELC 3.7 is a chapter called, What difference does it really make to know a patient's thoughts, concerns, and hopes. And hopes is another word for expectations. And hope's a good thing, isn't it? What are you hoping for? We all like a bit of hope. Well, in this, um, the podcasts that go with this and the written materials, it discusses how you can elicit the patient's expectations and understand them. And then when you know that, you can then go into module four. And Liam, if we can just go into module four, I think we can go into next module at the top there. Okay, if you just come down, calm down, come down, stop here. Um, you can then use the skills of chunking and checking, which is TALC 4.3. And if you go down again, uh, you can use the skills of can your words be healing in their own right? Because you can pick up the hopes and expectations that the patients have that you found out in the first part of the consultation and talk about them in the second part of the consultation. And I think we did uh, briefly allude to the idea that sometimes patients' expectations are not what you're going to do, and you, in effect, have to say no to people. And in Module 5, which we don't, well, we can go to if Liam can get there quickly enough, but in Module 5, which is advanced skills for explaining and personalising care, uh, there's a one in there called how to say no while still saying yes. And there, I think it's just there. Uh, never say never. How to say no while still saying yes. And if you can say no to your patients while still saying yes to them, you'll feel better, they'll feel better, and you don't get into those big conflicts. Uh, 
So what I hope I'm showing you is that there are real practical skills that you can use day to day in here with demonstrations and podcasts. And module seven about saving time in consultations explains exactly how you might set about using a good structure to your consultations, which tends to make them run better to time. And there's also a chapter called Why is summarising the engine of the consultation? Because summarising is the thing that helps the consultation to move gently to its next phase. And if it's moving to its next phase, it'll get to the end. So thank you for listening so far. And I'm just asking Liam to go back to the main page now. And he's just going to show you the other animation that's on the front page. Um, that's it, that one there, um, which is why this is so important. Welcome to Talk, Teaching and Learning Consultation Skills. This is a resource brought to you by Health Education England North West. Thank you for listening. Clinicians are always pleased to hear this phrase from a patient. It means that the interaction has gone well. When a patient and a clinician talk together, this is a consultation and everything else in healthcare flows from this important meeting. A consultation is a complex meeting between experts. The patient brings their expert knowledge of themselves and their situation. The clinician brings expert knowledge about healthcare. Having the right consultation skills improves your effectiveness at work. Whether you are a nurse, a physio, a pharmacist, a doctor of any kind, a midwife, a therapist, an assistant practitioner or a paramedic. Many of these skills are also used by reception and administration staff who talk with patients. The TARC resources can help any clinician to take their consultation skills to the next level. Having effective consultation skills means patient and clinician can collaborate to create a personalised care plan. This happens when evidence-based guidelines are combined with empathic, patient-focused care. This is good for patients who are more satisfied and who also get improved clinical outcomes, for example, better blood pressure control. Clinicians who work in this way provide care to higher standards and often reduce healthcare costs because patients are more involved in discussions about their care. The TALC approach helps clinicians to make fewer errors and to enjoy their work more. They can go home excited and energised. Take a look at the TALC resources to see what will work for you. Thank you very much, Liam, and thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed that, and please get on your phones or when you get home on your laptops, have a rummage round and play with the TALC resources. Thank you very, very much.